Well, welcome everybody. I am so happy to see so many of you here. Welcome, welcome to Trend Oshawa. Uh, my name is Roger Lohman. I'm a professor of anthropology here at uh, Trent Oshawa. And uh, we're so delighted here to offer for our uh, inaugural uh, anthropology lecture series for the year, uh, Professor Helen Haynes, who's uh, our very own uh, faculty member here at Trent Oshawa. She's um, well known in Oshawa because she's had a uh, field school at the museum down by the waterfront uh, doing uh, some investigation of the pioneer days here in Oshawa. She also has a field school she's been operating in Belize on a Maya site, which is of course what you're all here to hear about, which is her research uh, on ancient Maya and specifically how it relates to this idea that we're hearing floating around that we've got another month to live. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> is it the end of the world or not? And according to who? And what is that Maya dating system anyway? It's not a computer dating system. <laughs> Although some archaeologists would disagree. Anyway, I don't want to steal the stage. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Professor Helen Haynes. Um, wow. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's really quite a surprise to see uh, such, a, such a full house for uh, talking about such an ancient dead culture. Um, I sort of want to start off by sort of uh, telling you a little bit about sort of what, what motivated me to give this talk. Um, I'm sure you all remember this poster. Um, you may have even seen the movie from 2009. And actually back in 2009, I was actually interviewed by Jay Ingram as part of the Daily Planet's television show where they were talking about you know, the, this, this end of the world. And, uh, that was, you know, back in 2009, and I promptly sort of forgot about it and thinking, you know, I mean, who's really paying attention to an, an, the ancient Maya and the ancient Maya calendar? And then I first sort of realized, like, how, how pervasive this is in, in our culture when just this last spring, I was giving a talk at an elementary school. A friend of mine was teaching a course in archaeology, and bioarchaeology, and she asked me to come and talk to the kids. And afterwards, during the question series, a little boy, like a first grade boy, asked me, was he going to die before Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I'm sorry to say, but no first year child, I mean, first grade child, should actually be, be worried about this. And that's when I realized really how pervasive these sorts of images have really become in the literature and, and in our culture and in the news media. And what's really interesting about this is, is that um, everyone seems to be pointing the finger at the ancient Maya for this phenomenon. And so the point of tonight's lecture is to sort of unpack this idea about 2012, the end of the world, uh, these philosophies, and sort of exactly what the Maya may or may not have actually attributed to this. And uh, to start, I, I kind of want to tell you just to briefly exactly who the Maya are, where the Maya are. Um, so you can sort of situate this. The ancient Maya were and still are actually a living group, an indigenous group in Central America. They are everywhere you see blue on that map. So this is basically the Yucatan Peninsula, the area of Cancun, down through Guatemala, Honduras, and my own little country of Belize, which is a tiny little sliver off to the side there. Um, and the modern Maya are the descendants from the ancient Maya. And the ancient Maya are the people who you've probably heard of, the ones who built the cities in the rainforest. Um, and also, interestingly, developed the only fully syntactic written script in the New World. Um, and that's, of course, part of the problem, of course, is this written script. Now, they did suffer political collapse around 1000 AD, and another one again when the Spanish came in the 16th century, but they did not disappear. Okay, so anything you hear about the mysterious Maya and all that, that's really not true. The Maya still exist, and the Maya actually still do have something to say about this sort of phenomenon, um, but that's kind of for, for a different soapbox. So the first point I want to make tonight is, is yes, the Maya really did exist. And yes, they really did write things down, okay? Which raises a sort of important question about when were they writing this stuff down? What sort of time period are we actually looking at when we talk about these ancient Maya prophecies? Um, the earliest writing we have in the Maya area uh, dates to the fourth century BC, and it's the images that you see on the right of the screen there. 
These are the San Bartolo murals that were found um, by William Saturno in Guatemala. And the problem with these very early scripts is that um, the writing system is, is very unformed. You can sort of see it there. It's very pictographic in its origin. And we really don't have a good decipherment for it. So we can only pick out one or two sort of characters. There are other areas in Mesoamerica that also developed writing, um, such as the one that you see on the left of the screen there. This is from the Olmec area. This is the Casajo block. It's, it's uh, an Olmec piece. Um, the thing here is, is that these are not deciphered. These are more pictographic or mnemonic devices, and so we don't really even know what these texts say. No one can accurately decipher them. But the Maya writing did develop. It developed into a very beautiful and very literate script. And they wrote it down on a lot of things. So we have a lot of documents <coughs> <pardon me. coughs> um, from the Maya world, or documents on different sources. Um, there are several painted murals that are coming to light. We have them on ornaments, such as that, that jade piece, which would have been a pendant. Um, <coughs> the black pieces down below are ear flares. They're uh, decorations. Um, we also have them more famously carved on stone monuments. Um, this is perhaps some of the, the most prolific of the material that we have. We also have them painted on ceramic vessels, and we even have a few books. The Maya actually had books. We call them codices, and they're, as you can see there, sort of a fan-shaped, kind of like the fans we learned how to make in elementary school. And you would open them up, and then you could actually flip them over. The thing is, is that we only have um, five of these left. Uh, the vast majority of them were burned in the 1500s by Bishop Diego de Landen, what he called the great act of faith, or the auto de fe, when he gathered up all of these what he called heathen books, and he burned them. Now, five of them survived, as I said. There's the Dresden, which is we're going to get back to. Dresden is, is part of the entire issue here. Um, it is the most beautiful of the books, and it was discovered in 1739 in Vienna, which is why it's called the Dresden. We also have a Madrid Codex, which is the longest. It's over six and a half meters long. Um, and the Madrid is largely horoscopes and almanacs for divinations. Um, it's very pragmatic. It's the most pragmatic of the texts. Um, we also have one from Paris, called obviously the Paris Codices. Um, it's the most accurate of the codices in terms of depicting time cycles, but unfortunately it's also the most damaged. We only have about 30% uh, of it. 70% was lost. Um, when it was originally found, it was found actually in a basket next to a fireplace. People were using the old pages uh, to roll up and to light to start the fires. So, um, you know, it was like, <laughs> just think how much knowledge went up in smoke that day. Um, we also have one called the Grolier, which is perhaps the most controversial. It belongs uh, to the Grolier Club in New York, and there's a bit of debate about whether or not it's authentic or not. The paper certainly is, although people argue back and forth about the images, because the images are very, very rough. And we actually have one that has been found in an archaeological context, the Mirador Codices. It was found a few years ago in the Mirador Basin in central <coughs> Guatemala. And unfortunately, because of the humidity, what's happened is the pages, which are gessoed with a lime gessoing before being painted, have actually merged together. And so we can actually see the book and we can kind of peek to see that, yes, it's painted, but we actually don't have the technology yet to get it open. So we have this beautiful book and we can't open it. We don't know what it says. And, um, so we do have a number of sources, though. The Maya were quite, quite literate, um, which sort of creates this issue. They were literate, they wrote things down, but okay, so what texts do we actually have out of all of this huge corpus of material? What texts do we have that actually talk about this end of the world phenomenon? Um, and the truth is, none of them actually reference the phrase, the end of the world. What they reference is a date, a very important date. Um, and it's the, what's called the end of the 13th Bactun to the Maya. And it's actually written down in Maya glyphs, as you can see there on the right of the screen. That's actually how the Maya would have written this down, and if you want to look. Um, these, are, these are zeros. Um, this is uh, the number 13. And this is actually a, a separate calendar, which I will talk about. But this actually is for a how 
eight kum kum. So you're looking at, in our script, when we write it, because I don't know about you, but frankly, my drawing is terrible, and my ancient, my hieroglyph handwriting is awful. Um, we write it down as 13.0.0.0.0 for a how eight kum kum. Now there's a variant on this, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, which is, again, the 13th back tun, and it's for a how three kan kan. But the key thing here is this idea of the 13th back tone. It sort of raises the question, what is this date? What is so important about this date? Well, the 13th back tone is a date on the ancient Maya calendar. It's sort of like saying the 11th of November, okay? Or the 24th of November. This is Remembrance Day or American Thanksgiving. They refer to it as the end of the 13th back to We'll get to why it's important in a second. Um, in order to sort of understand the key question here about when this 13th back to that is so ultimately important to the Maya, um, and is the root of this end of the world phenomenon, you have to, you have to admit, you know, saying the end of the world has a larger cachet than actually saying, the 13th back to right? You know, it doesn't, doesn't carry that same sort of like publicity with it, so. But in order to kind of understand this 13th back to you have to know a little bit about how the calendar works. And more importantly, you have to understand which calendar that they're referring to. Because the Maya actually had seven calendars that they used, okay? So already, what you're hearing is you're hearing a very limited slice of what the Maya actually thought about time. These are the seven calendars. They're called the vague year, the Tolkien, the Hab, the Lords of the Night, the Lunar Calendar, the Venus Cycle, and an 819-day cycle that they track that we can't figure out what it's related to. So if there's any mathematicians out here who want to challenge, you can try and figure out what the hell 819 days is related to. Um, I'm really going to focus on the top three, the Vagir, the Tolkien, and the Hal. These form what we call the long count date, and that's literally what this 13th Bakhtun is related to. It is specifically geared uh, coming out of this long count calendar. Now, the Maya kept time very much the same way we keep time. They had days, months, years. They had their equivalent of a decade and they had their equivalent of a century. The only difference here is the Maya didn't calculate things in factors of 10, they calculated them in factors of 20. It's called a vestigial cycle. And so you have a day, a month, we're gonna explain what a Maya year is in a second, and then we have what's called the katun, which is their decade, this 20 year cycle, and a baktun, which is 20 katuns, or we would think of it as a 400 year cycle. Um, the, the thing here is, is that um, the long count in the Maya calendar, and the reason we specify the tun, we refer to it locally as, as sort of the Maya calendar, or the Maya year, um, is that it doesn't actually equal 365 days. It is not a solar calendar. It is this constructed calendar of mathematics. And so what you're actually looking at is one day equals obviously one, a month, or a week now, equals 20 days. They had 18 months, and this is the sort of only variant to kind of keep in track vaguely with the cycle of the sun. 18 months of 20 days, which is 360 days. Okay, not 365. And then, of course, the 20 captains is 7,200 days. 20 of these is 144,000 days. Um, we refer to this as the vague year, or the Maya year, because it is vague, it's not exact, it's not the 365 days. And it's kind of important to keep in mind that this calendar is in fact, for all you know, these higher math numbers, it's very much like the one that we use now. It counts the number of days before turning over. We don't say day one, day two, day 280, day or 360, day 365, we would say January 1st, you know, June 1st, December 31st. But it's the same idea. Our calendar counts 365 days before tripping over. 
This type of long count calendar is the same idea. It is literally a count of days. And in Maya, it is actually translates as the count of days or the keeping of the count of days. And the people who monitor the calendars in modern Maya society today are called the day keepers. Okay, so this is a very long standing phrase. Now, the 13th Baptun is obviously going to be a huge number. In fact, it is 1,872,000 days. That's how long it takes to kick over. This is a huge number, okay? But it's not atypical to count like this. In fact, we have a very similar system, but most people don't seem to realize it. We call it the Julian day numbers, which should not be confused with the Julian calendar, which is our, our current calendar. But the Julian day numbers are what are used by astronomers to record celestial events. And they literally started this calendar on the 1st of January, or what would have been the 1st of January, in 4,713 BC. That date, 4,713 BC, equals the JDN 1. So today, the 27th of November, is actually JDN 2,456,259. Okay? So for all of you who thought that it was November 27th, really? No. <laughs> Although it's easier to say November 27th than it is 2,459, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this isn't unusual, okay? This is, this is a normal sort of idea to count like this. And so if we want to compare this idea of the count of days, we can do this very easily. This is the sort of example. So, so the today, the 27th of November in the year 2012, is actually the 331st day of the year 2012. We would call this 331. The Maya long count would record this day as it's the 12th Bakhtun, the 19th Kaptun, the 19th Tun, the 18th Wino, and the 15th Keen. So the 12th equivalent of a century, the 19th equivalent of a decade, the 19th equivalent of a month, the 18th month, and the 15th day of the 18th month. Okay? Or, if you want to put it to the Maya day numbers, 1,871,975. Okay? And as you saw, there's our Julian day number the same. So, in fact, what we're actually seeing are very similar types of systems here. <laughs> the other two parts that I said I wanted to mention, um, the other two parts of the long count, the Tolkien and the Hob, are very integral parts, and they do come back in a few minutes in the story. Um, these are the sacred calendars and the solar calendar. The Tolkien is a very, very old calendar. It actually predates the Maya, we can actually see it on some of the very earliest carved monuments. Even if we can't decipher anything else, we can actually pick out this Tolkien. Um, and it is, in fact, actually still used today in the highlands among the Maya. This is a calendar that is used to predict events, to create horoscopes. People are named after these. These are very auspicious days uh, in this calendar. And it's formed from the calculations of two prime numbers to the Maya. The number 13, which is a very important number, we've already seen the importance of 13, we've mentioned the 13th baptism, um, and the number 20, which is their basic counting system. This equates to 260 unique days. And again, this is not all unusual, because when you think about it in our calendar, there is only one July 1st in every calendar. There is only one February 14th in every calendar. And so the idea of unique day names, again, a very common concept, although one that we don't generally think about when we think about our own calendar. The Hob is the closest thing to the solar calendar. It calculates 18 months of 20 days, and then to sort of make up for this, these missing days, it has the unlucky month of Wyeb. It's five extra days at the end of the Maya calendar where you try and do nothing. Okay? You try not to be born. <laughs> You're very unlucky to be born. You know, consider very unlucky for women, I guess, to go into labor on the fourth day of that. Um, but it is, it's a time of sort of when you 
clear off your fires, you close down your hearths, you sweep out your house, and you wait for the new start of the solar calendar when you will rekindle your fires, you will buy new food, and you will start the year afresh. Okay? Again, this is not that unusual a phenomenon. We see these sorts of ideas about cleaning out your house. We see this in, in the spring celebrations. We see this actually on Middle Eastern calendars, the start of the Persian New Year. People do these sorts of practices all over the world. Um, the interesting thing here is, is that the Maya used these two calendars to interlock. And you can actually see sort of the great wheel there turning. Um, they locked these two calendars together to form a 52-year cycle so that the start of the Tolkien and the start of the Hab will actually come back around and meet every 52 years in a great circle. And the Maya often used this as a type of shorthand when they were writing down their calendars because as you saw, the entire long count series of glyphs is a really long thing to carve. Right? So if you can kind of get away with just abbreviating it, right? which we do too, we often say 27 NOV apostrophe 12. It's the same sense. It's a type of a shorthand abbreviation. And we'll get back to why this is really important uh, in a few minutes. So that's the second point I want to make. Yes, it is true. The Maya were excellent timekeepers. But so were a lot of other people, and so were we. Okay? It's a matter of observation and mathematics. Okay? It's not all that mysterious a phenomenon. So getting back to this 13th Bakhtun, why is the 13th Bakhtun so important? Well, it comes back down to that first document I mentioned, the Dresden Codex. And at the very end of the Dresden Codex, on the very last page, is this image. And what you're actually looking at here in this image is a woman up here in the sky pouring water down and water coming out of the heavens, depicted as a serpent here. These are images of the sky. You know those represent the sky band. Pouring it down on the image below. What this is actually recording, according to Maya legend, is one of the attempts of creation. According to Maya legend, the gods made several attempts to create beings that would worship them. They made them out of mud, they made them out of wood, and each time they made these creatures, and the creatures proved unable to worship them, they didn't have heads, they didn't have hearts, um, the gods promptly destroyed them. And there's a variety of different ways, different legends in terms of how they got destroyed. And the stories don't always match up. Okay? In one case, they burned the wood people. In another case, they brought them down by flood. And in another case, they turned them all into the monkeys that live in the trees. So there's really no consistency in this. In this particular document, keeping in mind that we only have literally four documents that can be read out of hundreds that were burned. In this particular document, we are actually seeing um, the first mother pouring water down in a flood to flood the world and wash these creatures away. Now, the interesting thing here is that we know this date. This is the date, 13 Bakhtun, eight ahau, or sorry, four ahau, eight kumku. Now, the interesting thing here is this is the only time we actually have a date for a destruction of the world. According to the Maya legends, they're kind of vague about how long each of these worlds lasted. And in fact, they're even very vague about how many previous worlds there were. So when people start saying, oh, we're living in the fifth world, they're actually talking about a different Mesoamerican culture. The Aztecs were the ones who said this is the fifth world. The Maya simply said, this is the current world. This is the creation world. So we don't actually know how many worlds there were. And also, we don't even know how long these worlds lasted. Some may have lasted quite short. The stories are quite short. Some apparently lasted longer than others. 
they seem to have lasted as long as was needful. And that's what we can say about this issue. Um, so yes, this is the third point to clear up. There really is a reference to an end of the world. But it's the end of the previous world. The end of the world of the wood people who gave rise to us. We are, the Maya, were made out of corn. They are the people of the corn dome. Um, so that much is true. There really is an end date. But this is a past date. This is a date that happened thousands of years ago. So it raises the question, okay, well, if that happened thousands of years ago, where are people getting this idea that the world will end? Where is this future date? And this is where it gets very interesting. Um, we do have monuments that reference the coming 13th Bacton. We have two monuments that reference this, and only two monuments that reference the coming date. One is a stila from Tortuga that was found in the 1980s, and it is the first of the monuments we found that mention this future date. And more recently, um, they have found this corona calendar. It's actually found at a site we refer to as La Corona. That's a modern name for it, not the ancient name. Um, but it does also reference this future end date. So now we do have a future point. So when is this future point going to occur? This is a really tricky question, and it sort of gets us back to that calendar round, the 52-year cycle. It becomes an issue of how do you correlate a calendar that is clearly based on a different mathematical system with our calendar, with our Julian calendar. Um, and the easiest way in which people do this is they rely on those Julian numbers, those Julian day numbers, so you can actually get the math going. But the problem comes, again, with our lovely friend who burned all the great codices. Um, he also wrote things down. He kept his own accounts of what was going on, and it is actually called the Yucatan before and after the conquest, or in Spanish, Relaciones de las Cosas de los Yucatan, or the Relations of Things of the Yucatan. Um, it's a lovely manuscript. Unfortunately, we do not have all of it. We have a later copy of it. But he did write down things he thought was very interesting. Dates that the Maya were celebrating, um, ideas about their language. And the interesting thing here is, is that after the first collapse of the classic Maya political system in 1000 AD, the long count ceased to be used. In fact, the last full long count date we have dates to 909 AD. Okay? So by the time the Spanish had arrived in the 1500s, that calendrical system was long out of use. They were simply using the 52-year cycle. And of course, you have nothing really to tie that into. However, he did write down certain events. Like he told us, Landa told us, that the date 13 a hao, 7 zu, fell in the year 1539. He also told us that the date 12 Khan to Pop, which the Maya celebrated as a colonial New Year uh, day, actually fell on his calendar on the 16th of July, 1553. Now, my colleagues, who are much better mathematicians than I am, who specialize in Maya writing and Maya calendrics, um, have gone into great deals of discussions about exactly how these two dates, if you cycle them back, how many cycles back you would have to go in terms of these numbers of days, keeping in mind counts of days, um, to actually get back to the classic period long count dates. And the other interesting thing about this is, though, that when you actually start these little wheels turning, what they've actually found is that there are certain impossibilities. These are only two of the dates that, that Landa recorded. Um, there's actually impossibilities in terms of how these two things go together. And they've actually found that the post-classic documents that Landa recorded are actually off slightly. They don't quite line up. And it's created some discussions about whether or not that these are errors in the transcriptions, whether Landa wrote them down wrong, or whether there was a type of a break 
in the knowledge of how these calendars work. Right? The passing on of these things was through a lot of oral traditions after the classic period. Um, and so that there might have been a little, you know, fudging of that kind of broken telephone idea that we all played with in, in, in elementary school. Um, more recently, in fact, as of two weeks ago, a new discussion has emerged that actually suggested that these errors may actually indicate that the calendars changed at different times of the day. That one calendar changed at dusk to the new day, and one didn't change until dawn of the next day. And that this would account for these things being off by these one day, this, this sort of error that's in it. Um, and so it has also led to sort of debates about this mathematical issue in terms of trying to correlate these. We call these the correlation coefficients, the number that you would use to match the Maya calendar to a date in our calendar. This is called the Goodman-Martins-Thompson correlation. And they say that the date, the number we have to use, the count of days we have to use to correlate these is 584,283. Um, Goodman, started, uh, Goodman started this Martin is polished it, and Thompson, another archaeologist, perfected this. However, they're not alone. A few years after this, Lonsbury has argued that that coefficient is incorrect, that it doesn't take into account certain astronomical events, and that what we really should be looking at is the number 584,285. More recently, this new correlation that just came out the other day, <laughs> just a couple weeks ago, um, done by Martin and Skidmore, has argued that the coefficient should actually be 584,286 days. So what does this mean in terms of putting the two calendars together? When is this 13th back turn going to actually end? Well, if you use the GMT, um, it's going to end the 21st of December, or it will fall, I should say, on the 21st of December of this year. If you follow Lonesbury, which many of my colleagues do, um, it will say that it will fall on the 23rd of December. If you follow the new Martin and Skidmore correlation, we're looking at December 24th. Um, if you think this is fun, look at these. Other people have proposed correlations over the years based on their own map. So either it was the 17th of August in 1492, which one might argue would be a very auspicious date for the world to end for the new <laughs> um, You could also look at Spindent, which is dated in 1752. In other words, the world has already happened and we're just a little slow on the uptake. Um, or you could go with Valiant's correlation of 774,083 days, which means we're safe for another 500 years. Okay. Um, so all of these have been put forward as the years have progressed. So the bottom line here, and this is the fourth point I want to make, is we don't know an exact date for the coming 13th back time. It could fall anywhere within that four day period, okay? Depends on whose math you prefer, what side you want to take. So now that we know that we don't actually have an exact date, okay, that we've got a four-day window, we can still ask the basic question, okay, what's going to happen in the four-day window? What did the Maya mean when they talked about this 13th factor? And for this, we have to go back to these two monuments, the Estilaces at Tortuga, um, and in a few minutes, I'll show you the La Corona Stila again. But let's start with this one. This is the first of the monuments. Um, Stephen Houston and David Stewart, uh, two, again, expert uh, epigraphers and colleagues, have looked at these uh, in quite detail. Um, what is written on this monument records the dedication of a shrine or tomb. And in fact, according to the archaeological accounts, this was actually found blocking the entrance to a tomb. What it records is it records a specific date in the 7th century, 9, 11, 16, 8, 18, uh, 9, it's now 6, Kayab, or if you use the GMT, let's go with the GMT, we're looking at a date of the 11th of January in 669 AD. And what it's basically saying here is, is that it's a ritual dedication to this shrine, this tomb, 
and it happened on this very specific day. And what's very interesting is that it also records what we call a sort of a posterior date, which means it then says it occurred so many days after an important calendrical event. And in this particular case, it occurred just over a year, 1.1818, after the period ending of 9-11-15, for a how, three mole. These period endings, these cartoon endings, always end on an ahau date. And that's a very significant uh, uh, word for the Maya. Ahau is the Maya word for king or ruler. So it's a very important, prestigious date. And so what they're doing here is, is that they're actually tying this calendar back into a significant calendrical point, the end of a cartoon cycle. Um, and it contextualizes this event in the sort of larger chronological time periods. So where we get into problems is we get into problems with the very last section, right down here. And this is a drawing of that by my colleagues. And just as it starts getting interesting over here with the verb statement, my glyphs are actually read in pairs going down. So just when it starts getting interesting, referencing this, the glyphs are eroded, right? And of course, this causes a whole host of issues as people speculate on what was there. Of all the places, you know, to have missing text, right? Just when the story gets interesting, it's like, you know, somebody's ripped the last chapter out of a mystery novel here. However, they have done a lot of studies on this and a lot of studies on other Maya texts in terms of how these posterior dates and in this particular case, we call it anterior date because it is then contextualizing this event by saying how many days it happened before this 13th Bakhtun comes up. And what we've seen is, is that it's literally simply restating this dedication. And it's referencing the coming 13th Bakhtun as a way of bracketing time. And so saying this event took place here in this larger cycle of time, the end of the 15th Captain up to the coming of the 13th Bakhtun. It never says anything about a destruction here. So let's move on, okay? So there's no prophetic monument here, okay? So it's like, oh, you know, why, why bother with this? Go look at the second one, the La Corona monument, the La Corona calendar. This is the second reference we have, again, to the 13th Bacton. Um, it was excavated by Marcello Canuto and again examined by David Stewart, who actually wrote a fabulous book that I could flog for you called The Count of Days. Um, and in it, uh, what he's realized about this particular uh, piece is, is that the text talks about the political history of Corona. Um, it was actually found as part of a stone staircase and it is commemorating a royal visit to Corona by the ruler Yuknom Yishak Ka'ak from the great Maya city of Kalakmul. Now Kalakmul was one of perhaps the major players of the day. You could call it almost the Washington DC of its time. It was a prominent capital that reigned over a very large area of influence with many of these sorts of adherence to its cause. Um, and in this monument, they refer to Yuknum, let's abbreviate his name there, Yuknum, as a 13 Kachun lord. And that's a title that we see by kings who preside over important ceremonial dates. And the end of the 13 Kachun, or the 13th decade, um, of the ninth Bakhtun was an important point to celebrate this number 13. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that they're using the number as a way of saying I did this important ritual on this particular date. I hosted this huge festival. Um, and then what he does to further elaborate or vaunt himself up is that he then links his 13th Captain celebration to a future 13. And of course, the next 13 in the cycle is going to be the 13 Bakhtun. And so the reference here, again, is to sort of conceptualize this event and to give it a larger sense of history, to put it into this broader spectrum. 
And as Stuart has noted about this time, that this particular point in time at the end of the 7th century, the beginning of the 8th century, was a time of great political turmoil in the Maya world. Kalakmul was actually one of two primary centers. There was another center to call, and of course you can imagine what happens when you have two major political centers in the same region. They fight with each other a lot. Okay? And so this is a period of great instability. And so what we're actually looking at here is this idea that by linking themselves to this greater concept of time, we are actually seeing them trying to smooth out the crises by saying, I was here at the 13th captain, the world will exist into the future. Everything that's going on will be resolved. And Canuto, the excavator, has actually pointed out about what, what the text shows is that really, in a time of crises, the Maya used the calendar and this reference to promote continuity and, st and stability rather than to predict an apocalypse. So, it kind of in an interesting way, it's very much sort of the opposite of what we are seeing. And as I said, this referencing back and forth in time, we have a lot of evidence of this. And I could go through endless texts and endless texts, but really I'm pretty sure you're all just going to take my word on it, because you probably don't want to see me doing the math a lot here. <laughs> um, but these are two of the very famous ones that people visit if you ever go down to the Maya world. These are two very prominent Maya sites, Palenque in Mexico uh, and Copan in Honduras. And at these two, again, very famous sites, you will see monuments that reference posterior dates and anterior dates, but not the 13th factum. They are putting them into a smaller concept of time, but it's a very similar, similar practice. Um, so then it gets to the question, okay, we now know they talked about the 13th factum, they referenced the 13th factum, but did they think the world would end with the coming factum? No. <laughs> sorry, sorry to burst your bubble this early. No. There is no discussion in either of the two monuments that reference the coming back to Is there any indication that they said the world would end? People have assumed that because the Dresden Codex refers to the previous world ending on the 13th back to that the current world will too. But as I said, all of the previous worlds, we don't have dates for them. And as I said, some lasted longer than others. And none of these stories, except the Dresden, gives us a date. They're all very vague on this. Um, and in fact, there's considerable evidence to suggest that the Maya actually saw the world as continuing past this. A very recent discovery, as of this year, um, Again, this was actually done uh, by William Saturno, who founded the, the, the San Bartolo murals, our oldest of the murals, at a nearby site at Chaltun. He actually found, again painted on the walls, this fabulous calendrical system. They think it's, it's potentially an, an astronomical um, room or school, and the walls are covered with these numerical calculations about time. Um, and in fact, it's recording up to 24 units of time. I gave you five units of time, right? They actually had larger units in the back to and this actually shows this. Um, so this is the point five that I sort of want to clear up tonight. The Maya never said that the world would come to an end, okay? But it does raise the question about why is this 13th date so important? Why is it referenced? What is so key about this? Well, as you remember that the Tzulkin calendar had 13 numbers in it. 13 is an important number to the Maya, okay? Sort of like some people have a lucky seven, okay? Um, there were 13 levels in the Maya heavens, okay? There was, as I said, 13 numbers in the sacred <coughs> calendar. And our current world was created on the anniversary of the last 13th back turn. And so 13 is a very important date. So this coming of the 13th back turn is a key date for the Maya. But they never said the world would end. They just said this is a big date. So it raises the question.
question, if the Maya didn't say it, although they're getting the bum rap for it, um, who did say it? Well, a lot of this actually started, my colleagues have done a lot of research on this, um, and they've traced it back to the individual on the left of the screen, Frank Waters. This is sort of one of the first references we have to this. Um, Frank Waters was not an anthropologist. Um, he was a novelist, a bit of a journalist, and a mystic. And he wrote a number of books about various Native, uh, Native American and, and Central American cultures, um, including this one, which is probably the one that caused all the problems now, 1975, The Mexico Mystique. Um, in this, he actually cobbles together a lot of these myths from Mesoamerica. Aztec myths, Maya myths, current Highland myths, translations of older myths, and he sort of wraps them all together, and in this, he somehow came up with the proposition that these prophecies, these, these stories from the Maya world and the Aztec world, somehow proposed that the calendar would end and that there would be a transformation of world spiritual awareness. Only he originally predicted it last year, okay, 2011. This idea has been picked up by another writer, Jose Aguileas, the person on right of the screen. Um, Jose uh, wrote a book, The Mayan Factor, The Path Beyond Technology, in 1987, in which he promoted a 28-day, 13-month calendar, which he says is based on the Maya mathematics and will return us to harmony. Only, didn't we just talk about the fact that the Maya never actually had 28 days in their months? So, again, we can sort of see a little bit here of, of fudging with what the Maya may or may not have said. In the past several years, there has been a whole host of other books that have actually come up on these subjects. Um, this is just a small selection of the books. Um, but some of these, again, uh, they're very quite interesting. Uh, the two on the bottom, Diane Cooper's 2012 and Beyond, um, and Frank Joseph's Atlantis 2012, um, they actually directly reference the Maya. Um, and I'm going to read a passage from Diane Cooper's book, and, and in light of what I've recently told you, we can sort of unpack this idea. Um, according to Diane Cooper, she says, according to the ancient Maya, the energies coming in on that day, and that day being the 21st of December 2012, will activate the Kundalinda force in individuals and on the planet. The prophecies say that it will stimulate the genetic memory of our past lives and who we truly are and accelerate many of us into enlightenment and extension. The problem is, we just looked at the only two texts that actually reference the coming back to. And Neither one of those talks about enlightenment or accession into the heavens. Frank Joseph does not make any sort of uh, com comments about that, but he does say that the Maya calendar terminates precisely on the morning of 2012, the winter solstice, at 11 a.m. and 11 minutes, coordinated <laughs> universal time. Uh, frankly, you know, Maybe he's right, but then his math is a hell of a lot better than mine and all of my Mayan colleagues. Because as you can see, we can't even agree on a day, and we can actually read those pictures. So um, I'd really love to know where he got the 11-11 time frame. But again, this is saying the Maya said this. There's a whole host of other theories that are coming up, and again, they are saying the Maya are saying these things. You know, ruling out the other various disasters that people are predicting, food shortages, cataclysm, war in the Middle East, biblical Armageddon, floods, fires, frogs, locusts, you know, the whole works of things. Um, three of these I sort of do want to unpack. This idea of the magnetic poles on Earth reversing. Uh, the worry that there will be unusually powerful, as NASA refers to them, solar maxims, or as we refer to them more commonly, uh, sunspots that will occur, and this really prominent idea that the Earth and the Sun are going to align with what's called the dark rift, or the black hole at the center of the universe, um, and that this is going to cause some sort of upheaval on the, on the planet's uh, orbit. So let's look at these, let's unpack these again. Um, magnetic poles reversing. Okay, here's a surprise for some of you, perhaps. This happens. 
the magnetic poles on the Earth do in fact actually reverse, and they have reversed uh, several times over the last several billion years of the planet's history. The last time they did this was 780,000 years ago. However, it takes over a thousand years for this to actually occur. Okay? Um, and we can actually track this because we can track volcanic action in melting molten rock and we can see the slow change in the alignment of the metallic ores within these. So we know, yes, this happened, but we also know it's not going to happen overnight. Okay, it's not going to wake up the next morning and all your compasses are going to be wrong and you're going to have to throw out your GPS. Um, keep your cars, really. Don't go buy a new GPS. Don't change your vehicles. You're, you're fine. Um, solar maxims. This idea of solar storms. Again, these actually happen. This is a real phenomenon. Um, although according to NASA, you're going you're to do astronomy, right? Go to the experts. Um, solar activity has a very regular cycle and it peaks approximately every 11 years. Um, and near these activity peaks, yes, solar flares do cause occasional interruptions of satellite communications. But, according to NASA, people I go to, there is no risk associated with 2012. They do say the next solar maximum will occur sometime between 2012 and a 2014 time frame. Um, but this is part of an average cycle that the sun goes through all of the time. And again, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen all at once. In fact, it takes about nine minutes for light to reach us from the sun. So the effects of these solar maxims can take anywhere from you know, a couple hours to a couple days, depending upon the force of the explosion from coming out of the sun at. So again, it's not a sudden occurrence. Okay, let's look at this one, the galactic alignment issue. According to NASA, there are no overall planetary alignments for the next few decades. And even when planetary alignments occur, they have no effect on the Earth's gravity or the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And this idea of a galactic alignment, that the Sun will line up with the galactic center, seen there on the purple line, um, and the orbit of the Earth's Sun is the green line, um, this courtesy, I can give you the web link. This is uh, some work by, by uh, Mark Van Stone and uh, another uh, prominent uh, uh, Maya Pigrifer. Um, this is actually happening um, already. Um, it has, in fact, been going on since the late 1980s. And, in fact, the sun will be in contact with that <coughs> center, that galactic center um, up until 2019, okay? Um, the sun is a big object, okay? <laughs> the universe is a big place. It's not like you're crossing the street when you're trying to move something the size of the sun. This is a 40-year slow phenomenon, and it's referred to as the precession of the stars, okay? And it has to do with the fact that our universe is still expanding. And so, the stars and the sun are still changing ever so slightly their alignment. And they'll continue to do this literally until the next big bang happens, however many billions and billions of years that will happen. So this is not a rare event. This is not a particularly you know, momentous event. These sorts of things happen for the last, you know, 25 years, and will continue for the last 25, or next 25 years, for several decades here. Um, so this is the point, sixth point I want to make tonight, that um, the Maya never predicted any of these supposed prophecies. Um, not only are any of these sort of massive cataclysmic events on the agenda of the universe, like these things, aren't even on the awareness of the universe here. Um, so where do we get this? What exactly is December 21st? What should it mean to us? Um, the answer is it can mean anything really that you want it to. Okay? December 21st is the winter solstice. It's a great, great time of the year. Um, it's also, perhaps, keeping in mind the four-day window, um, it's potentially the birth of what the Maya see as our creation. 
So it is the birthday of the current world, according to the Maya. And yeah, you know, if you're birthing a world, maybe four days is you know, not, all that, not all that unacceptable. Um, it is also perhaps the New Year's Eve for the Maya calendar. The Maya, for the record, are not a homogeneous group. They are, as you could see, a very widespread population with different variations on their legends and different variations on their ideas of these calendars. There's some argument that the calendar will in fact actually reset and that we will go back to sort of 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. There's some evidence from Palenque that we might just go to 13, 0, 0, 0, 1 and keep going, okay? So this may or may not be a New Year's Eve for the Maya. It will, however, perhaps be, as I said, an important date. So when it comes to the question, 2012 and these prophecies, these end of the world prophecies, um, is this a Maya or modern issue? And really, it depends on the question you want to ask. If you ask the question, did the Maya calendar, will the Maya calendar hit an important anniversary date? Is it going to be a significant date? Sort of like December 31st. Then yes, that is a Maya prophecy. If, however, you're going to ask me, is the world going to end in a cataclysm? Um, is there going to be a great galactic awakening and great harmonic convergent? Then no. We're looking at a very modern phenomenon, a very modern concept. So if you want to do something, you want to try and, and celebrate or remember the important date, then I suggest you kind of do what I do, which is basically, well, frankly, I'm going to Belize with a couple of bottles of champagne to celebrate it. <laughs> now, if you have your own Maya site and your own Maya temple, why not, right? Um, but I would suggest that basically that you enjoy it and you sort of party like it's 5,125 and a quarter years, which is basically what 1,870,000 days comes out to. Okay? So hopefully I answered sort of your questions. I put some of you to rest. You know, you're not going to go stock up on tins of tuna or bottled water. <laughs> um, is there any questions? Yes? I would like to make a statement. Sure. It's, it's very interesting what you presented to us, but there's very little fact, factual, if anything. Everything is open to interpretation, speculation. Yep. Like the scientists you quote, mm -hmm. anthropologists, mathematicians, everybody puts a different spin yes. on it. So you cannot come really down to the point and say, this is from A to get to B, this is the road to go. Correct. Everything leaves itself open to whoever looks at it, whoever studies it, whoever sees things. It's like religion. You can the interpretation can be multiple mm -hmm. different ways. The Torah is 2,000 years old. Exactly. And everybody looks at it and sees it a different way. But the thing here is, is that the point that I kind of want to get across is, is that a lot of these new age ideas, a lot of these concepts about the destruction of the world, people are pointing the finger at the ancient Maya. The movie 2012 even talks about, they have a, a, granted a brief scene, at the very famous Maya temple at Chichen Itza. The important thing here to keep in mind is, yes, we don't really know. You can interpret this in many, many different ways. You can see it as you wish. But the Maya are not the ones who said the world are going to end. So these are very modern concepts. These are modern ideas. We cannot attribute these to ancient philosophies because, you know, maybe they did say something in those other thousand books that got burned, but we don't know. We only have, you know, a very limited corpus to work with. Yes? Do the modern Mayas say anything about this date? Um, yes, they do. Um, they're actually kind of angry about it. <laughs> you, can, you can see some of the responses from some of the elders who basically say, we don't want to take the bum rap for this and we don't want to get blamed when nothing happens. They're not really expecting anything to happen. They are thinking, yes, it is a very significant day to them. Um, but yeah, for them, the calendar is just going to start over again. And actually, if you, if you reference a colleague of mine, Alan Christensen, who um, has done a lot of work with the modern Maya and a lot of work with modern Maya ideologies, if you ask them, they say the world dies every night. The world dies every night to be reborn the next day. And this is a natural cyclical process and how they see time as this cycle. So for them, it's not actually going to die and end. It will die and be reborn, the same way it happens every year. The same way you could argue that our calendar does on December 31st. Yes? 
Um, I sort of get the sense you, you haven't made this reference explicitly, but some of the writers, for example, Tom Harper and others, uh, mention the idea of midrash. I don't know if you're familiar with that. In the Hebrew tradition, when they would tell their stories, they, they never um, anticipated or expected that people would read these in a historical or a literal context, even the story of Jesus, for example. They, they, they were telling almost like a passion play. This is how they would like society to act, uh, celebrating certain festivals, uh, the temple or the tabernacle. I, I'm, not, I'm not religious, but this whole thing about the mind encounter is not saying what happened or what's going to happen. It's kind of saying, let's live our life this way. Let's do these rituals. This is just a good kind of thing to do. It's not meant to be uh, uh, interpreted literally. It, it's almost that it has a midrashic kind of quality. Well, it, there is really nothing in it that says how we should with this 13th Bactin or how we should not behave with the 13th Bactin. It is simply a date. So it's sort of as if saying, you know, I gave this talk on the 27th of December, which is 12 years after the millennium started and 78 years before the next century will start. It's, it's a way of conceptualizing it into a broader history of time. There really is no sense of, of action involved in this 13th Bacta. These are just primary reference points on the larger calendrical scale. Yes? Is it known to modern science how far this knowledge about the Mayan calendar was spread within their own population? Was it just a nucleus of priests? We had the insight, we had the information, and we noticed it took up a hand. Do we know at all how far spread it was in those days? Um, we believe that the writing was primarily limited to the upper or to the elite class, although there obviously is evidence about how the calendar functioned in the culture itself. Because as I said, we see these Tolkien calendars existing well before the Maya and existing well after the Maya and existing in many cultures around it. And the fact that the Tolkien and the Hobbes, this, 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 this calendrical round cycle, actually survived the political collapse at the 1000 ADs and even the upheaval of the, the Spanish arrival suggests that, that this particular calendrical method is, yes, much more widespread within the population. As I said, it's used for divination purposes. People consult it when their child is born. Um, they want to make sure they're born on auspicious days. So. The clinical round system is, is quite widespread, I would argue. Uh, but the long count date, no, the long count date, from what we can tell, is, is, was much more restricted. Um, however, it's a little hard to say because so much of the documents were burned, and what we do have the most of are these political statements on buildings. And so we're getting really a very limited selection of the writing, and most of it is elite propaganda. So it's, it's a little hard to, to sort of uh, suggest what happened in the ancient world. Yes? Look, looking at the modern side of it, um, it seems very coincidental that the world seems to be, you know, with all the troubles everywhere, and uh, it's, it's endless. Um, we seem to be resetting ourselves over the last year and a half, and it, it seems to be coming to a, a bit of a climax. Um, we could have argued wars. the same thing at the end of World War II, you know, if the Maya calendar fell, you know, uh, uh, anywhere near the dropping of the atomic bomb on Japan, we could, we could have made the same argument. We, we may actually be, yes, coming to a climax, but we don't know if, if we are climaxing or if this is going to get even higher in the like future. Everything's being reset. Like, like, right. um, you know, it, it is how we perceive history at the moment. We can't pre really predict the future, so we don't know if, if this is a resetting or if it's simply our current perspective on time. If we wait another 20 years and we look back, we may think, no, 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 you know, it wasn't 2012, it was 2015 when we saw this happening. Or, you know, 2012 isn't really all that bad considering, as I said, you know, dropping an atomic bomb on a couple of cities. So. It's, it's a perceptual issue that we have on time, and, and it is a sort of a very individual concept. So, I thought I saw a hand in the back. Yes? Well, this is the thing about the new the new Chultun, the calendar round uh, room that I just showed you. Yes, this actually has these mathematical calculations that suggest that they were predicting time like 4,000 years into the future. And all it really is is this is just a, a matter of math. So on the walls of this room, 
we see these mathematical calculations going backwards and going forwards. And so yes, so there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that the Maya believed that time would continue, whether it continues as year one again or a year 13 back to in one. That's what sort of debated because they didn't actually write that bit down for us. <laughs> Maybe they did somewhere, but it might have just gotten burned. Yeah. What's the fascination for them with time? Do we have any sort of information about why that was so important to them? The whole understanding of, of time and why they need to understand the dates and um, You know, one could argue that their fascination with time isn't all that unusual, no more so than ours. I mean, we live our lives by, by clocks and times and schedules. Um, we have, you know, iPhones that beep at us. We have pagers that go off. We have alarm clocks that get up. We keep our, we regulate the days of our lives in different ways. And the Maya calendar is, is pretty much the same way. It, it's not so much a fascination with time. It's just a way of recording their history. These things happened on these particular events. We do the same thing, 1492. Right? The Battle of Hastings, 1066, right? the end of World War II. We talk about time in, in the same way. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I hope that I kind of answered your question.